one scientist who stands out in the story of equations because he took the idea of beauty in science further than anyone else. And his name is Paul Dirac. He too revolutionised our view of the universe, yet virtually no one outside scientific circles has heard of Dirac. So I've arranged to meet the biographer of this mysterious genius. This is uh, a particularly favourite part of uh, Cambridge for Paul Dirac. Dirac was the greatest English theoretician since uh, Isaac Newton, and that's how that's his reputation in 1927, when he was uh, looking for what became his greatest achievement, his equation. Why is he uh, being so great? Why is he totally unknown to? the general public. He actually wanted anonymity. He really had no interest at all in celebrity. He simply wanted to get on with his work and, uh, uh, and, and, and be unknown uh, to the outside world. I love the idea that for Dirac, beauty is important. Is there a sense in which it is more important for him than I've been hearing so far about other scientists. Oh, yeah. Dirac was the first scientist actually to elevate this idea of beauty to a principle. He called it the principle of mathematical beauty. And what he meant by that was that as we advance in fundamental uh, theoretical physics, the theories, as they get closer and closer to nature, become more and more beautiful. So for him, it was a, it was a, it was a method actually of sifting out theories right from wrong, because if it wasn't beautiful, if it was ugly, in his opinion, it just wouldn't cut, uh, pass muster with nature. So for him, a theory had to be beautiful for it to stand a chance of describing nature. Incredible. Here's a scientist who insisted science went through a filter of beauty, and by pursuing beauty, you end up with truth. It's an idea that's often used metaphorically, but Dirac meant it literally. This is the Bridge of Sighs, uh, which he walked across as a fellow. He walked back to his rooms here. And uh, this is where he did his great work on, uh, on the Dirac equation. In fact, he was just, uh, he was staying in a room just here. Right. That's where he was working in the months, late months of 1927 on what came to be known as the Dirac equation, one of the greatest achievements in modern science. We are room A4, New Court, where, where Dirac discovered his this is great this room. equation. Completely free of distraction. The only noise you get, a little bit of noise from the punters outside. Apart from that, no radio, just nothing. Uh, Dirac was not given to luxury. In the late 1927, all he did apparently was to work on that equation. Tell me about that equation. Mm -hmm. what, what, what was he trying to accomplish with it? Well, what he was trying to do was come up with an equation for the electron, the first fundament material fundamental particle uh, to, to have been discovered. And what does that mean, first fundamental material okay. particle well, uh, no, 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 okay. discovered? Uh, 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 a, a, a fundamental particle has no constituents. It's a completely basic particle. You can't subdivide it. Right. right? So the point of the tiny, tiny, tiny thing, this electron, mm -hmm. is that nothing else is more basic than it. That's right. So you have a chance of giving a, of giving a fundamental description in nature. Uh, I've got a notebook in my bag. Mm -hmm. If I give that to you and you find a blank page, yep. and I then give you my pen, right. could you write out for me the... The, th the equation I that will. Dirac came up with. I will. It's called the, the Dirac equation. That's right. This is the Dirac equation. And this equation applies to every electron that's ever existed or ever will exist in the entire universe. So this is the ultimate compact equation that has this universal significance. This is a miracle. It's one of the miracles of 20th century science. You've shown me the miracle. Mm -hmm. T now tell me what it is. I okay. see uh, something like I followed by squiggle, Gamma, followed by yeah. P, followed That's by right. squiggle, followed, yeah. followed by equals, followed by M, followed yes. by squiggle. Yes, what? okay. You say I gamma P psi equals M psi. Okay, so it's like E equals MC squared, only you say these new things that he thought of himself, a bit like the Lord of the Rings language. That's right. Uh, and what is the most important symbol there? Right, okay. Uh, this is called a spinner. 
Mm -hmm. All right. This is a thing that encodes the information about the behavior of the electron. So you tell the equation what, what situation the electron is in, and out of the equation comes the prediction for how the electron will behave. What's the thing in the ordinary world that is the closest that I could visualize mm -hmm. to tell me what a spinner really means? There is none. Okay, so I've right. got to accept that. Exactly. It is, that's right. This was a complete Dirac concoction, right? So right, spinners didn't published. exist before him. No, right? no, 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 they didn't. Right? You yeah. have to learn his new language before you can oh, say yeah. that equation. Pe seriously, people for six months a year were struck. Brilliant world-leading physicists had no clue about what these, what this equation meant. So it was. This is why he was so far ahead of his time. They were having to say, "What the hell do these symbols mean?" It was on extremely good ground, and moreover, if it stumps the world's top scientists, then I think it's okay for it to be beyond me. This really is a foreign language. But I was getting a broader sense of how equations have advanced knowledge. That better nature, better. I do feel from your talk that I'm starting to get a picture filled in for me of science. The, the, the big points, Newton, mm -hmm. Einstein, mm -hmm. and now Dirac. That's right. And the, a sort of journey that the spheres, uh, the planets, the stars, this earth, mm -hmm. everything on it, all the objects can be somehow described and yeah. understood That's right. in mechanical terms. That's right. Einstein said that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. And Dirac, Newton, Einstein, they all had faith that they could, if they thought hard enough, they could come up with these laws that describe nature at a fundamental level. But faith doesn't produce more faith, it actually produces equations. Oh, absolutely. It's not, yeah, no, no, it's not, it's not like a faith that you can't verify. Faith That's why oils the words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dirac actually said that uh, the principle of mathematical beauty was a kind of religion to him. He actually used those words because he really did believe with all his heart and soul right, mm. that a, a mathematically beautiful theory was going to be the kind of theory that nature backed and that, if, and that, that was the w direction in which you should travel. So he really did believe that. It was an article of faith. Why is the spinner beautiful? Uh, this is beautiful because Dirac used this equation to predict the first example of antimatter. This was perhaps the greatest triumph of 20th century physics. All right? Just to give you a sense of how monumental that is. All right? Now, cosmologists believe that the very beginning of the universe, half the universe was antimatter. So by that token, Dirac conceived, using this equation, half the universe in his head. Scientists now stand in awe of Dirac's equation, but at the time, things were very different. In the late 1920s, antimatter was totally unknown. The idea that every electron, proton and neutron had an opposite partner was preposterous. If his equation predicted this make-believe stuff, then it must be wrong. OK, so... Um... What we can do now is go into the teaching lab. Oh. What we have is an experiment set up where we can actually see tracks of particles produced by antimatter. So you'll be showing me some antimatter in action. Five years after Dirac came up with his prediction, antimatter was discovered. The equation had turned out to be true. Now I too want to see the proof. This is the first practical place I've been to on this one. <laughs> I'm surprised right. at how quaint everything looks. This is a very simple experiment. This is very low-tech. Yes. And you could do this in your kitchen. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, okay, so um, this is a magnet. Actually, we can see it's a fairly powerful magnet. And so we're going to put dry ice on here, so that will be very cold. Okay. The sort of cookery element at the moment. It is. Cooking uh, is the first fish in salt. Yeah. Magnet. Okay. Now. The Perspex box is going to go on top, mm -hmm. and uh, there is alcohol that we put in the upper layer. And uh, in order to see the tracks, they're actually quite faint. We have to illuminate it with a very bright lamp. Okay. And then one of the other ingredients that we should uh, explain here is the radioactive sources that we're going to use. 
So uh, we have two radioactive sources. One emits uh, electrons, yeah. uh, and the other emits positrons. And so yeah. what we have here is an isotope of strontium called strontium-90. Glenn told me that these radioactive materials would let us see the tracks of electrons, and more importantly, the antimatter partner to the electron. Known as the positron, this is the particle predicted by Dirac's equation. It emits positrons, and we'll see tracks that are very similar, mm -hmm. right? maybe slightly lower energy, actually, uh, and they will be bending to the left. Okay. And, and so that really is the demonstration that we have two types of particles that uh, really look very similar in terms of the tracks that they make, mm -hmm. except that one is positively charged and the other is negatively charged. I'll try to do this rather quickly. So I've yeah. seen a couple. Yeah, yeah, I saw one going that way. And furthermore, they should be bending to yeah. the right, and they are. They're, uh, they're thin and irregular. It's like a string of beads almost. Okay, so all I've really convinced you of that you can see so far are bog standard electrons. Right, all right. So these are just even at uh, the bog standard level, it's pretty <laughs> impressive. We're all made of plenty of those. Ordinary. And so I, uh, maybe what we can try now is to uh, put in the positron source. Yeah. And hopefully, what we should see is that they will bend in the opposite direction. So the other one's slotted in scientifically, and this one you just sort of that's stick right. On we're there. just going to hold it on mm -hmm. to the entrance way. So now I should expect to see things going to the left. I'm seeing activity, but not necessarily lines going to the left. Well, actually, I just saw a couple of... We'd seen the electrons bend to the right. Now, Glenn hoped that we might spot the rarer antimatter tracks as they curve towards the other side. The one there, yeah, there very, go. very clear, there yeah. Very, yeah, there fantastic. <laughs> so that, that's the first time in this experiment that I've seen the antimatter. There you go. That was definitely coming from the source. The amazing thing is to have something from a sort of comic world of science fiction, antimatter, to have it uh, presented to us in, uh, in reality. Except I wasn't looking at that one. But <laughs> every uh, 30, 40 seconds, a little blip occurs within a sort of 10p size radius of the source. It shoots out, curls around, doesn't go very far. Then one, there, one there, very, that very was, curly that one. Was a clear yeah, one. Yeah, shot right round. Very good. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we're, so we're, we're really seeing a physical thing which um, connects to the very complicated mind world of Paul Dirac. That's right. Somehow the, the existence of antimatter you know, emerges as a necessary consequence of, of the theory that he wrote down. Yeah. And, and that's pretty difficult to see to just look at his equation and say that should give us antimatter, but really if you analyze it carefully, uh, it's, it's clear that that is one of its necessary predictions, and that's what you're seeing. So those curves and blips in that sort of molten sea is the Dirac equation being shown go. to us in physical <laughs> form. These elusive symbols point to a beautiful idea. There is something magical about them. The existence of antimatter proved his theory true. Keats's romantic poem goes, beauty is truth, truth is beauty. As if one leads to the other. And that's exactly what Dirac, the scientist, believed. That the search for beauty powers the advance of science. I'm reading a paper by Dirac, which he uh, delivered in uh, February 1939. He says, what makes the theory of relativity so acceptable to physicists, in spite of its going against the principle of simplicity, is its great mathematical beauty. This is a quality which cannot be defined any more than beauty in art can be defined, but which people who study mathematics usually have no difficulty in appreciating. So he's saying beauty in art can't be ultimately defined uh, any more than beauty in anything can be ultimately defined. But what he is saying is that people in the world of very, very high and complex mathematics agree that beauty is something that they all appreciate and follow. 
it may be that what Dirac is saying is that there's a, a sort of high or true or pure beauty that mathematicians are interested in, which sounds to me a bit like the inner, true, deep beauty of art that you have to go on a bit of a journey to find. You can't expect it to come leaping out and uh, waving at you straight away when you haven't really bothered to get involved with art and try and find out what it is.